Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is um, 11 o'clock and we are getting ready to get started. Uh, welcome for those of you that are joining us on uh, YouTube. I do know that uh, um, it is uh, a, uh, a Friday and uh, happy Friday to everybody. Uh, this this uh, webinar is, is uh, in recognition of the school bus safety week and uh, we wanted to culminate or, or finish off the week with uh, but at least the program in regards to one of the most basic things that you guys do uh, as a bus driver, and that's uh, uh, check a bus out as well as uh, check the braking system. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, dual air brake system or also known as a 121 compliant uh, system. And uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll go over the history behind the, uh, the, the why we do a brake inspection. And of course, we'll go through how we uh, do the brake inspection. We'll talk about uh, some of the, the components that you check. Um, you might uh, not be aware of, you, you don't get to see these components uh, most of the time. And uh, unless you had an opportunity to uh, see the Department of Education's uh, program on, on the dual air brake system, you probably don't get to see these, uh, these parts in action. So um, you, know, you won't be able to see them in action, but you at least will be able to see some of these parts, how they work and what they look like. So uh, my name is Tony Peregrina. I am the president of, uh, of CASTO, the California Association of School Transportation Officials. And I am uh, very glad to, to be here uh, presenting this, this program. I'm also a state certified instructor of the appropriate class. So uh, I do know a little bit about what I'm going to be teaching today. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to, to answer every question that you might have in regards to, to your uh, air brake system. Um, if you do have some questions, please go ahead and note them on your uh, chat there. I know that uh, a lot of you are already saying good morning and and uh, chatting all over the place. I don't get to see those. Uh, we, we do have a proctor that uh, will be taking a look at those questions and then following those, they're gonna funnel the questions over to my Zoom meeting so that I can answer them uh, during uh, the presentation. We're gonna try to hold those questions up to till uh, the end of the program. So when I get to the question and answer session, then, then I'll answer those questions. So let's get started. Um, how and why the brake inspection is performed. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, the brake system itself. So the, the, the dueler brake system that you use right now is, is a combination of prior systems. So some of the systems that uh, were used prior to the 121 system um, we're called single air systems. So the two most common systems are the ones that we're going to talk about because uh, they kind of created the, the 121, uh, the redundant system that you have now, that is a, um, uh, a system that has a backup to the backup to the backup to the backup. So we'll, we'll talk about how that works. And all you have to do is inspect the vehicle and know what you're inspecting, of course. So um, one of those uh, single air systems is called an automatic actuated system. Uh, when we say single air, we mean that there's only one tank for your service brake. So that one tank uh, allows for braking for the front and the rear. Uh, this is a system prior to the system that uh, you are probably using today, unless your bus was built uh, prior to uh, April 1st, 1977. Uh, and of course, it would have a, a, a single air system in most cases, and um, they are checked a little bit differently. We're not going to get into that system and how to check it because most of you don't have it. So the system, uh, uh, if it's system had a leak or a total loss in uh, the brake system, this automatic actuated system uh, has an emergency brake. It was either air applied or uh, spring applied once that failure occurred and um, it had a separate tank for the emergency stopping system. And when it had the separate tank, it had a separate means of activating the emergency stopping system. So uh, some of you, uh, you know, drive a car right now and, and you have this brake on the side, if you still have those kind of cars, my cars that way, where you can actually pull it 
And we used to call it a, an e-brake or an emergency brake, right? So when you're looking at your, your parking brake valve, that PP valve that's in, in front of your dash on your bus, you might want to call that uh, an emergency brake. It is not an emergency brake. Had your bus been a single layer system, then that valve that it's in front of the dash or a toggle switch that might be on the dash or on the side of the driver's compartment, then that might be an emergency stopping system, but it would say that on the, the valve or the screen of that valve like uh, is pictured here on the PowerPoint. It says emergency brake. Um, our buses say parking brake on them. So that is not your emergency brake. It is your parking brake. And we'll talk about how that works in just a little bit. So again, single air system, uh, automatic actuated. If you lost air in that one tank, um, it would automatically stop the bus. So you didn't have to do anything. Loss of air, bus stops by itself. All right. Um, modulated system uh, could be identified by a valve uh, on the dash or a twist lever located to the left side of the driver. And um, if the system had a, a, if the service brake had a leak in it, again, it was a single air, one tank then it had a, a separate tank for the emergency stopping system. So uh, the problem with this modulated system is that it did not have an automatic actuation of the emergency stopping system. So the automatic actuated, you had to do absolutely nothing. The bus stopped by itself. You didn't have to pull a valve. You didn't have to do anything. Uh, with the modulated system, you physically had to do something. All right. So whether it was on the column of the steering wheel under the column, that might be a lever that you would use uh, to turn on. Or um, if you look at um, uh, these pictures here, you have uh, this picture on the left hand side would be on the dash, which is uh, what you see right here on the screen dash on the on the right hand side. And uh, on, on some of the, uh, well, at least the buses that I saw, on some of the, um, God, what are those buses called? Not the Crown, but the Gillick. Those Gillicks would actually have that toggle switch on the side. And of course, it, if you look at it, it's actually red and it says emergency brake on it. So that is actually your e-brake. You had to like physically uh, turn that valve, push that valve down, do whatever it is that you needed to do to stop the vehicle. Now, the problem with the modulated system is that it requires that you do something unnatural, all right? Uh, what is natural for a driver is to step on the service brake. That's natural. The problem is that every time that you step on the brake, you expect the vehicle to stop. What happens when it doesn't stop? So think about it. If you step on the service brake and the bus doesn't stop, uh, you're going to step on the br brake again, right? More than likely, you're going to step on that brake a little bit harder, too. Um, evidence of that is, uh, I don't know, if you if you get to uh, watch news a lot, you'll see that, you know, people tend to uh, smash into um, uh, convenience stores or donut shops or liquor stores. And you're sitting there, it's like, what, what, how is that possible? And that person will turn around and say, well, my brake didn't work. Well, why, why were you going 100 miles an hour smashing into the store? Well, what happened was is that that driver uh, mistake, uh, made a mistake and stepped on the accelerator instead of the brake. And when the vehicle didn't stop, you stepped on the brake harder, uh, it being the accelerator. And guess what? You just launched yourself into that Walmart. So uh, although things are, uh, you know, it could be a blue light sale that day, uh, was that Kmart? I don't know. But when it comes down to it, uh, you shouldn't be accelerating into the store. Uh, the, the driver automatically perceives that if it doesn't break, that you put more pressure on it, and then maybe it will break. So this modulated system became a problem if you didn't train the driver on how to use it. Well, these systems were uh, very prevalent prior to April 1st, 1977, before your 121 or dual air brake system 
was uh, designed, built, and used as a standard throughout the school bus industry and, and, and really commercial vehicle industry in the world. So because this was prior to 1977, April 1st, there was no requirement for the driver to know the system. There was no requirement for the driver to inspect the system. So the driver had absolutely no idea how to check it. The carrier or the company had absolutely no uh, legal requirement to teach you how to check it. They left it to the driver to, to figure it out. So uh, what happens here is your natural reaction is to brake and brake harder and not to do this or this or this to stop the vehicle. So this modulated system was, was great because it had a separate system for the emergency stopping system, but uh, you weren't required to, to know how to, how to use it. So uh, hence the reason why uh, the 121 system was created. So Martinez or Yuba City accident. For those of you that are logging in today that actually live uh, you know, near or around uh, Sacramento, uh, Yuba City is a, is a town that's pretty close to, to Sacramento, and, and um, they are historically the, uh, I want to say, the owners of probably the worst, well, actually not probably, the worst school pupil transportation accident in California history. And let me tell you what happened. In um at 10.55 a.m. on May 21st, 1976, a charter bus carrying 52 passengers struck and mounted a section of the bridge rail on the Marina Vista off-ramp off one, uh, off I-680 near Martinez, California. So uh, it's a group of, of kids that are in the choir that are going to go to a choir competition in Martinez, California. And this driver is driving a, a modulated system type bus not automatic actuated. If it was automatic actuated, the bus would have stopped by itself. This modulated system required that the driver do something different other than stepping on the service brake to stop the bus. This is prior to April 1st, 1977. This is May 21st, 1976. So the driver did not require to be trained on the braking system. The driver is advised that this vehicle has an issue with uh, a, a leaking oil and uh, is told to take some oil on the trip so that if the alarm goes off, all he has to do is pull the bus over and uh, put in the oil and, and the alarm will go off. Well, drives down the roadway, steps on the brake. This braking system has an air leak. It's a single air system, only one tank. When the service brake goes away, there's no more service brake, so the bus is not going to stop. But the driver still had a, an emergency stopping system that would allow him to modulate. And basically, it was a um, like a steering wheel column type brake lever that he would be able to pull to modulate the emergency stopping system, the brake, to stop the vehicle if the service brake didn't work. But he didn't know anything about it. So uh, air starts to leak. It's not so bad where it continues to leak. So that compressor is kind of working uh, throughout the, uh, the, uh, the day so that if you're losing air because of the leak or you're applying the service brake, it's still building up air, but it continues to fight uh, building the air because of the leak. So um, as the driver's driving down the roadway, a light and buzzer comes on. Uh, that happens to be the lower warning device that comes on. At those days, um, the lower warning device was required to come on between 55 and 75 PSI. There was a bottom and a top limit for lower warning device. For uh, your buses now, 121 after April 1st, 1977, if it's a 121 compliant vehicle, the, the, uh, the lower warning device has to come on at uh, no lower than 60 PSI, and then all pressures below 60, it must stay on. So you only have a lower limit. You don't have an upper limit for your system today. So we're looking for 60, and all pressures below 60 is the requirement for your bus. This bus, uh, light and buzzard, uh, between 75 and 55, it goes off. He doesn't know it's the low air warning device. He's thinking it's uh, low oil, pulls the bus over to a safe location, 
uh, get, grabs a couple of quarts of oil, leaves the engine running, uh, which is now building air in the system. And as he puts the oil into that uh, that engine, well, it uh, it it goes away. And it goes away because you're no longer using the brake and the leak itself was not great enough where the compressor didn't catch up and uh, take it above the lower warning uh, sections where, where uh, this bus uh, would activate. So, so the driver leaves the bus running. I, I think that's illegal in California, right? Aren't you required to turn the bus off, take the key, put it in your pocket? You've got kids on the bus, even though they're high school kids, uh, you can't leave the bus running. So uh, what happened there? Well, uh, that wasn't required back then. And then what about the oil? Got it in the uh, compartment there, got a couple of gallons of oil. What's the big deal, right? Hazardous materials, no problem, right? Well, again, prior to the requirement of uh, or uh, the section that does not allow you to carry hazardous materials on the bus. So um, this situation or this exact scenario in 1976 changed a lot of things for the school bus industry. Notice that we talked about a, a charter bus. Um, back in those days, a school pupil activity bus did not exist. Uh, why does it exist today? Because of your air brake system, because the driver wasn't required to know the air brake system because the company wasn't required to teach the driver or to ensure that the driver was proficient prior to taking that vehicle out on the roadway unsupervised. So this specific accident is the why you have to check the brake system. So it's important that you understand that all of those little things that you've got to do that might get on your nerves every once in a while, you know, come on, I checked the bus out yesterday. What's going to happen today? Well, the, all the reasoning for it is because something really bad happened. So the bus rolls off the top of the curb bridge rail and landed on its roof. 29 occupants died and the rest sustained minor to serious injuries. So 29 occupants of that school bus passed away because the driver wasn't proficient because the driver uh, didn't know uh, what this brake system did and he didn't know how to check it. The driver didn't know how to activate or modulate the emergency stopping system on this bus. The reason for this class today is about pupil transportation safety. The reason for this class today is to let you know that those prior systems created a redundant system called a 121 system. And the reason why they call it 121 is because the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 571.121 is the section that governs when you manufacture a vehicle, that it complies with that section if you are going to equip that vehicle with an air brake system. Uh, we all know it as a dual air brake system because you know, uh, at the beginning, the, the systems had two tanks, one tank for the front, one tank for the back. We don't say that anymore just because there are some systems uh, out there, not so much on a school bus, but other commercial vehicles where there might be only one tank and that tank uh, does the work for, um, for both the, the primary and the secondary system. So the front and the rear. So the way it works is uh, it's got a, a different air dryer and that air dryer uh, uh, does the work uh, for the tank and that tank is kind of split in the middle and, and uh, it's a little complicated. You don't have to worry about it because at this point in time, I don't believe any school buses have this, uh, this type of air dryer in their system and most of our buses will have uh, two tanks or it'll be one tank and inside that tank. Uh, more than likely, we'll have the three tanks in there, the primary, secondary, and the supply. So what did it look like? Uh, the driver uh, makes a mistake. And when he makes a mistake, he um, believes that it's the oil, the low oil that's causing the warning device to come on. As he's driving down the roadway, he continues to lose air. He continues to apply the service brake. It gets to a point in time where if you don't have enough volume of air inside the tanks, then the mechanical parts that need to move to apply your brakes 
are not going to work. On a uh, 121 system, uh, the manufacturer of, uh, of this 121 system says that a minimum of 100 PSI is required so that all moving parts will work. That's the reason when you do your brake inspection, you never drive the bus with less than 100, mile, 100 uh, PSIs in the tanks. And it's a really good idea that you have a policy that you don't move the bus until you're at full pressure, air governor cutout setting. So the reason for that is if you wait till you're at 100 PSI, and you push in the parking brake, when well, that air is gonna go back to the uh, spring brake side to compress the spring, and you're gonna have less than 100 pounds and you're leaving that stop position with less than 100. Remember your manufacturer wants at least 100 so that you can apply and move all the moving parts. So in saying that, uh, this bus has less than the volume uh, needed to, to stop the bus or the moving parts to move so that we can stop the bus only has one tank, but he has a separate tank that allows him to stop the vehicle through modulation with his hand, but he doesn't know this. He gets off the off-ramp. The off-ramp has a 20 mile an hour uh, suggested speed limit that you can probably see if you can see that right there. Uh, that's 20 miles an hour there. So that's saying slow down. Uh, it's, it's a pretty tight curb. Uh, the driver can't slow down. He's driving a standard transmission, could have downshifted, but didn't know how. Um, and um, when it comes down to it, steps on the brake, doesn't stop. Steps on the brake again, doesn't stop. And then eventually, if you could see this area here, there's a car there, there's a gentleman right here. You can see this area right here that, um, that he mounts, he starts to mount. And then once he mounts the rail, falls over on the other side and uh, lands on its roof. So as you can see, the roof actually caved in. And, and if you look at the uh, side view of this picture, the roof is caved in to where the name of the company is. And uh, it looks yellow, it looks like a school bus, but it, they called it a charter bus. Well. It was not a school bus driver. It was a commercial driver that was driving the vehicle and they could drive that bus, although it was a school bus because they can use it for a charter. Unlike today, uh, a, a school bus can't be a SPAT bus. Uh, a school bus can be a commercial vehicle that can be used to be chartered, but then it's no longer a school bus. Uh, only a, a vehicle that's not a school bus can become a SPAB, and that's usually your charter buses and, and um, you know, those nice big air conditioning, you know, 50 um, LCD screens and all that good stuff that they have bathroom inside. Uh, that that's, that's a charter bus for us or a SPAB bus uh, for us now. Um, back in those days, they can use that school bus and put a commercial driver in it. Now, today, you can't. It's yellow, it's got uh, crossover lights, it's a school bus. Uh, you put a school bus driver behind it, it just becomes a school bus trip. So uh, it, as you can see, uh, between the roof and the section where the ending of the windows would be, all that's caved in. So the kids are right between the uh, ING and a little bit beyond this rub rail here. Uh, you can see a hole that's there. Uh, the first responders took hours to try to extract these kids from there. The, the, the space inside uh, the bus was probably uh, about two feet uh, tall. And uh, that's where a lot of those kids were, were lodged in there or some of them were actually trapped by the roof and the seat itself. So a, a lot of those kids uh, didn't make it, not just because of the accident or because the roof failed on the school bus, but also because the first responders could not get to the students fast enough. So we learned a lot. Uh, your, your buses have roll cages now. Uh, so if the bus does uh, roll, it, it doesn't end up on its roof. It ends up on, on its side. So it doesn't uh, impose all the weight and cave in. Uh, it's got reinforced sides to make sure that that roof doesn't cave in. So a lot of things changed because a lot of things weren't required prior to April 1st, 1977. 
which brings us to the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 571121, or also known the dual air brake system became required. So let me tell you a little bit about that brake system that you have. That brake system has four systems built in into one. So there's four, four systems inside the 121 system. You have the charging system, which uh, you will see um, as we're going through the program, uh, identified it as a blue. So anything that you see in blue is, is part of your charging system. Uh, you have a red system or a secondary system, which is secondary is the front brakes. So everything in red is the front. You have the primary system, the most important system, and that's green, and that's the rear braking system. And then you also have the parking system. And then notice that it says slash emergency stopping system because the parking system is the system that's used for your emergency stopping system. So uh, you can't call the parking brake the emergency stopping system, but you can say that the parking brake system is a, the system that's used to create an emergency stopping system. And that is identified as orange. So here's the blue system. Now uh, you might recognize this picture. This picture is from the brake port from the California Department of Education. And uh, for those of you that have gone through the program, if you're an instructor watching, uh, you got an opportunity to see that system and you get an opportunity to take pictures. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to take some of these pictures and uh, use them for the program to, because I don't have access to the board. At least you can actually see the parts themselves. So everything that you see uh, in the blue is your charging system. When I say charging system, it is the system that builds air for your air brake system. All right. So it's comprised of, uh, and we'll keep it as simple as possible. You got a compressor, you got a governor that you can't really see there, but I'll show you later on what it looks like. Uh, that's connected or uh, actually attached to the compressor on this, uh, on this brake board. Then you have an air dryer, and then you also have a supply reservoir. Some of us used to call that the wet tank, all right? Uh, your buses do not have wet tanks unless your bus is not equipped with an air dryer. This right here, this air dryer is what keeps the tank from being wet. Uh, so uh, when it comes down to it, that air dryer is gonna cool, clean, and dry the air in the system. So at any point in time when you drain your tanks daily at the ending of the day, and you see uh, moisture or maybe gunk, sometimes you'll see oil, or um, uh, coolant or fuel. I mean, all kinds of bad things are happening with your bus and that needs to be reported to your maintenance shop so that they know that your charging system is introducing some contaminants into the air brake system and they're gonna need to repair that. Uh, anytime you see oil, water, uh, coolant, uh, fuel, that's all gonna be coming from your compressor. The compressor is connected to the engine and it's using in most cases, depending on the type of bus that you have. And if you have a really big bus, sometimes they'll have their own oil reservoir and their own cooling reservoir. But if they don't, they're attached to the engine and they're using the cooling system and the lubricating system, oil and coolant to cool that compressor. That compressor is a little engine and it's got little pistons inside that uh, need to work so that when it's uh, going through its cycle, it's sucking air from the atmosphere and it is uh, putting in, uh, compressing it and putting it into the system uh, as needed. So if you see any of that stuff on there uh, inside any of your tanks, it's coming from your charging system. It can't come from anywhere else. So the front system or the front service axle system, uh, red. So anything that you see in red, so here's the blue, and then it goes from the blue, it pushes air into the red. So you'll have a tank, uh, you have a safety valve that's there so that your tank doesn't explode just in case your governor doesn't work. Uh, it also has a lower pressure switch on this bus. Uh, depending on the bus, it's going to depend where that lower pressure switch is. Sometimes they're on the 
gauges themselves on the dash. Sometimes they're on the supply reservoir um, and it's dual and it's splitting for the front and the rear, depending on your manufacturer. And on some buses, it'll be on each specific tank, the red and the green. So uh, I don't know where it is on your bus, but I do know that you have to have a lower warning device for the front and you have to have a lower warning device system for the rear. Both of them have to work. And I'll show you how that works and how you check that. You have a drain cock. Uh, you have some lines. And then if you look over on the picture on the right hand side, um, the red is connected to your service brake pedal. And it's also going to be uh, the service brake pedal is going to push uh, any air from the red inside to the pots that give you front braking power. Pretty easy. Uh, the rear at, or um, rear service brake or axle system. So the primary system is what we call this thing. It's, the, it's in the green. So it's uh, just like the red, it, it's green here and it's gonna have a safety valve, lower pressure switch, <coughs> excuse me, on, on, the, um, on the tank itself. Uh, it's got lines that go all the way up there. It's got a, a reservoir, it's got a safety valve. And then of course, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, it's also going to show you the, the rear brake pod, right? And that brake pod, if you notice, it's green and it's, it's stuck or married to the orange. And we'll be talking about that orange in just a bit. So that green pod that you see there, um, oh, bring it back. Uh, the green pod that you see right there is what's going to activate the rear brakes when you apply the service brake, all right? So the orange is the parking brake uh, system or emergency stopping system. And so as you can see, the orange starts right where your parking brake valve is, all right? That parking brake valve is orange. And you notice that it has the little valve right there that you push in so that you can move the bus. And then you pull it so that you can park the bus. That valve gives you all or nothing all of the braking uh, power or none of the braking power. There's no way to modulate just a little bit of braking power with the valve itself, all right? So that's why it's called a parking brake. As you can see here, it's yellow and it says pull to apply, push to release, and that is a parking brake, not the emergency brake, not the emergency stopping system. But if you notice, it's also connected to this little valve right here. Uh, that little valve right there is called a spring brake control valve. This valve is important. It is the most important uh, part of the emergency stopping system because that valve is connected to the green and connected to the red, and it's also connected in a part of the orange. So how that valve works is that if you lose the rear brakes on your bus, that valve will sense lack of air or no air in the green, and it allows for the orange to be used. The parking brake system works off of lack of air. So when you pull the parking brake, you'll hear a psh. All right, what happened there? Well, if you look at your brake pod, the orange one there, Inside that brake pod, there's a, a large spring that's very, very strong and requires a lot of power and air pressure to compress it. So in order for you to move the bus, that, that spring has to be compressed so that you can move the bus. If not, it will move the moving parts, and I'm not going to get into all the parts, but it's going to push that push rod uh, so that it, it uh, applies the brake, basically. So in order to move the vehicle, you got to push in the parking brake. And in pushing in the parking brake, you're going to hear a That air goes into the rear of the bus to the rear brake canister, this canister right in there, and it compresses the spring. Now, if you see this rod right here, we call that a push rod, that rod would push in because there's no more air inside. I mean, there's no more spring uh, expanding it so it pushes it in, therefore moving the push rod, moving the slack adjuster, and disengaging uh, the brake. So allowing you to drive the vehicle forward. But as soon as you pull the parking brake, psh, that rod is going to expand 
uh, or be pushed out, turning the slack adjuster, applying your uh, your brakes, or if you've got uh, um, calipers and, and disc brakes, it's, it's going to apply the brake. All right. So uh, compressors, uh, very simple. Like I said, uh, it's, a, it's a little engine that compresses air. It takes the air from the outside and there's two types. You have a gear driven compressor or a belt driven compressor. 99.9% uh, .9 of the buses that I've seen, just because I haven't seen all the buses in California, are belt driven compressors. The gear driven compressors, which uh, are these over here, those gear driven uh, compressors are usually in larger vehicles. So it's a larger compressor and it's also connected to the engine. But <clears throat> what turns it on is basically the, the gears in here are connected to the engine gears. And when you start the vehicle, it, it, it activates or starts the compressor. What starts this compressor on the right hand side is a belt. That belt uh, is connected to a pulley that's outside over here on this where this little red knob is. So there'd be a pulley right there and that's where your, your, uh, your fan belt would be. And then as soon as you start the bus, that compressor starts. It's not compressing air, it, it is active. It's only gonna compress air or allow air into the brake system when your uh, air governor identifies that you don't have enough air in there and at a, a specific set number activate. Uh, governor. So the governor is uh, that little piece right there. And if you saw this, uh, this last slide, you can see that it is connected to your compressor. It doesn't necessarily have to be connected to the compressor. Look at your engine when you get a chance and you go back into your bus and look for that governor because that governor is connected to a couple of lines. And that is what's allowing the air to go into the system. It tells the compressor, you may now feed the air into the supply blue reservoir. And then that blue reservoir will push the air out to the red and the green, the primary and the secondary. <clears throat> uh, the governor is what you checked when you do the air governor cut in and your air governor cut out, all right? So it is, um, it is born with a number. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say it's born with a number, it is born with a number, all right? If I have any mechanics out there, uh, the mechanics can tell you that uh, if that number is not working for you, that they can actually adjust the, um, the governor so that it stays within the legal limits. According to the manufacturer, you cannot adjust the uh, cut in and cut out of this governor. So uh, when it starts failing and we need to fix it by adjusting it, then we probably need to replace it. It's no longer working the way it was designed. And when it's born with a number, it's gonna be born with a cut out number and it's gonna be born with a cut in number. I can almost guarantee you that every single one of your buses is gonna have an air governor cut in above or at 100 PSI. Why? Because you can't move the bus or all of the moving parts need to have at least 100 pounds of pressure uh, to ensure that they all move uh, uh, the way that they were designed uh, to move or activate. So the air governor cut in is probably going to be somewhere at 100 or above. The newer the bus, the higher over 100 it is. At least that's what I've seen, uh, but uh, not necessarily. Again, I'm looking for that governor to cut in somewhere around 100 PSI, but the minimum or the air governor cut in minimum is no lower than 85 PSI. If you get to 84 PSI, you can't take the bus. Of course, the mechanic might turn around and say, look, hey, I've got this calibrated gauge and it says it's actually 87 PSI. Uh, but if your, your, uh, your gauge is saying 84, you gotta go by, by, by what you see and uh, the compliance rating and percentages for compliance is for the vehicle to, um, to pass inspection and not for the actual vehicle inspection performed by the driver. So you gotta go, go by what you see. So they're not gonna like you cause they're gonna um, be upset cause they know it's still uh, compliant. But when it comes down to it, it's what you see is what you get. So if it's less than 85, you can't take the bus. If it's more than 130 PSI for the air governor cut out, that's the maximum, you cannot take the bus. So uh, 131 can take it, 129, you can take it, 130, you can take it. 
So not a problem, just as long as it doesn't go above 130. So uh, uh, governor cut in no lower than 85 PSI, governor cut out uh, no more than 130 PSI. And that's uh, basically what that uh, governor is and it does. It's a little bit more complex, but because this is not an instructor program, uh, I'm not gonna get into exactly how it works. That's what you're checking right here. Uh, no lower than 85, no more than 130. But if you are um, very, very smart, like I know you are, you're going to apply pressure to the service brake lightly so that you know exactly what the number is. Remember that I said that it was born with a number? So once you know what that number is, it must stay the same every day, as long as you're applying the brake pressure exactly the same way every single time to check for that number. On my bus, 105 PSI uh, for the cut-in, uh, cut-out is 127. On the bus that we're going to be using today at one point in time, I don't know what it is, but we'll find out what it is once we get there. So it might be a little bit different. That's okay as long as it's within the parameters. Air dryer, very simple. Uh, what it does, it's like uh, the hair dryer, all right? It dries, right? This air dryer is designed so that we don't have all that gunk and stuff inside the uh, supply reservoir, which we used to call the wet tank because it used to be wet. We don't want it wet. That uh, AD9 air dryer is going to dry, cool, and clean the air. And when I say cool the air, uh, that little compressor is working really hard and the air is going to be hot and heat causes uh, moisture. Uh, the air is coming from the atmosphere and the atmosphere has dirt. If you drive in areas like we do here uh, at our school district, <clears throat> the rural areas pick up a lot of dirt. There's a, a possibility that when the air governor cuts in, you're sucking all that gunk inside. The air dryer is going to do its best to keep that gunk inside the air dryer and it not go into your supply and then primary and secondary. Supply reservoir, very simple. It is the blue tank. It receives the air from the charging system. It is the first tank that will receive the air. You don't have a gauge for that tank. So I can't check how much air is in that tank. But what it does do, it delivers the air to the primary and the secondary. And hopefully it's keeping any gunk and any moisture in it because it's receiving the air first. But if you got a problem, more than likely, if you find it in that supply, you're probably gonna find it on the uh, primary and the secondary tank. A uh, one-way check valve, all right? The one-way check valve, if you take a look, this is your supply reservoir. It's connected right next to the tank itself. So the green tank there, what does it look like? If you look on the inside, uh, it is going to be receiving the air from, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's receiving the air from here. So when it pushes the air or the, the compressor is building the air, uh, it's gonna push that little um, diaphragm that you have there or a little rubber piece. And then this right here is a spring and it pushes the air inside the tank. We call it a one way because it goes into the tank it does not allow it to go out of the tank. If you wanted to check your one-way check valve, you can actually drain your supply reservoir and look at your gauges on the dash and those gauges should stay put, all right? So if you're draining the rear and the rear starts to drain when you're draining the supply reservoir, your one-way check valve doesn't work, all right? So let's talk about the, um, Okay, <clears throat> the uh, lower pressure switch on this bus, it's actually located uh, right where the safety valve is connected to the tank itself. Uh, this, uh, this little device right here on the right hand side on the picture on the right is the lower air warning switch. They come in all kinds of different colors and sizes and shapes and forms. You don't ever need to see it. All you need to know is that's connected to the electrical that's connected to your tank so it knows the volume. It has to activate no lower than 60 PSI, all right? And of course, it must stay activated at all pressures below 60 PSI. All 
All right, so uh, rear reservoir, uh, same thing. Again, we're gonna have the low air pressure switch uh, on that side uh, and for this uh, braking system and for this bus or this example of the bus, each tank has a lower pressure switch. It doesn't necessarily have to have one, uh, one on each. It, it, like I said, it could be one that's located on the supply reservoir with two prongs that identifies both sides and uh, or it could be on the gauges themselves. And then who else? I don't know how, what else has come out uh, since the last time I asked uh, the manufacturer, but uh, they could be in any place. The key is the only way that you know that it works is that you have to lower the pressure so that it activates. You should be able to hear it and you should be able to see it on the dash. And that lower pressure warning device should come on no lower than 60 and stay on at all pressures below 60. Double check valve, all right? So a double check valve is a valve that does absolutely nothing, nothing. It just stays right there, all right? So if, for those of you that like football, I absolutely love football and, um, you know, go Brady. I know some of you might be Brady haters, but uh, I'm not, I, I've been following him from, uh, from a, a long, long time. He's in, in uh, oh, close to my age group, I wish, but um, uh, I'm really excited. He has a great uh, middle linebacker. That middle linebacker is uh, one that stays uh, behind on the line and watches for the weak side. If someone comes to the right, uh, that middle linebacker is going to slide over to the right and stop that person from uh, getting past the, the line. Uh, if if, uh, if it's weak on the left, it, it's gonna slide over to the left and it's going to protect the left side. So what does this thing do? What's sitting uh, in between the primary and the secondary tank. So it knows it's got a uh, full pressure in the front, full pressure in the rear. In my head is that little cylinder that you see there. So what happens if I lose air in the back? Well, that double check valve will sense the weak side and it will slide over to the weak side and seal it off, allowing for one tank, which is in the front, to give you service brake power. All right, I hope that makes sense. So what do you think it's gonna do if you lose air in the front, All right? It's gonna slide over to the weak side, seal it off and allow brakes in the rear, all right? So if I lose the front brakes or the front tank or the red, that double check valve is a part of the emergency stopping system that always allows for you to have one tank to apply the service brake, all right? What makes that happen? The double check valve. How do you check the double check valve? Well, pretty easy. You dump the air in the front tank, leave the rear alone, and only the front should drain air. If both of them drain when you're draining the front tank, then the double check valve is no good. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Pretty simple, middle linebacker, what does it do? Nothing. If I lose air in one tank, it slides over to the weak side of the tank that's losing air, seals it off, allows for one tank so that I can apply the service break. That's what it looks like when I lose air in the rear. And that's what it looks like when I lose air in the front. That's what it looks like when there's equal air on both the front and the back. You will never be able to see it. We just have, uh, like I said, the Department of Ed let me take a picture of that and uh, allows me to, to, to uh, show you what that would look like if you lost air in each tank. All right. Park brake control valve. All right, so uh, there's all kinds of size and colors um, and they, they all do the same thing. They allow for you to uh, push it in, put air in this tank right here or um, cylinder or canister, pushing the spring back, allowing you to move the bus. But when you pull the parking brake, that valve pulls the air out of that air pocket there, that little balloon or diaphragm, and it expands the spring applying the brake. That's what it does. It gives you all to park or none to drive. 
relay valve. The relay valve is a valve that allows for the rear brake to apply before the front. And let me tell you why that is important. If you're riding on a bicycle and you had front brakes and rear brakes up here, and you apply the front brake first as hard as you can, what do you think is going to happen to that bicycle when you're going 20 miles an hour? Uh, more than likely, your body is going to push forward and you're going to end up with no teeth because you're going to flip that bike over. Well, that's exactly what happens when you brake in the front prior to the rear. You lose control. What allows for control braking is rear brakes. So when you press on the service brake, it's got a long way to travel to get to the back. So it doesn't actually take the air from the pedal when you're applying the brake and put it in the back brake canister. What it does, it spits a little um, a burst of air through a line that goes to the relay valve and that relay valve opens the port in the rear tank, the screen tank here, and pushes it directly from the rear tank to the canister so that the rear brakes apply before the front giving you controlled braking. Always remember, no matter what happens, I have to have rear brakes. I have to have rear brakes. And if you don't have the rear brakes, you don't have controlled braking. You can lose control and not be able to stop safely. So that's what the relay valve does. It relays the information of what you're doing in the front pedal, taking the air from the rear tank, pushing it in, in the rear canister as it's uh, also applying in the front. Air gauges, telling you how much air is in the tank. So you need to know exactly what's in the front and the rear tank. You can have one gauge, two needles, or one gauge, one needle per tank. So you might have two needles for each tank. Spring brake control valve, again, it is the brains of the operation. If it senses that you lost air in the rear tank or the rear brakes, it will allow for modulation of the emergency stopping system or the parking brake system by the use of the service brake to modulate it. Remember, parking brake was just a valve, right? That spring brake control valve knows you don't have any air in the rear. And what it does, it takes air out of the spring brake canister and it uh, applies the brake using spring force. So when you apply the brake, it exhausts the air in the rear and it applies. So it applies air in the front and takes the air out of the rear to expand the spring. So it's working opposite under that condition. So if I was going to identify the emergency stopping system, I would say double check valve, spring brake control valve, parking brake system, right, which is using that whole system there uh, in the spring inside that canister in the back. Of course, how do you stop the bus under emergency conditions? You use the service brake. You don't have to do anything to uh, any of these parts to make it work, but you do have to be, you have to be able to check it. All right. So let's talk about a couple of things that are going to happen. These are two scenarios, right? That uh, when you take the test with CHP, they might ask you some questions, all right? So let's just say that um, under normal conditions, what's going on? As you're driving down the roadway, you can see your front brakes have no air in them. They're white. Rear brakes have no air in them, right? They're white. But in the back, they're orange. That means that there is air inside that canister to compress the spring. So as you're driving down the roadway, when you push in the parking brake, that is the uh, where the air went. It's right into there. So what happens when uh, the brakes are under normal condition? The double check valve does absolutely nothing. The front brakes uh, have air in them. The rear brakes or rear tank has air in them. I step on the service brake, air goes from the rear, uh, from the front tank into the canisters, now they're red. 
and from the rear tank directly using the relay valve into the rear of those canisters. So now I have air parking brake, rear service brake, front service brake. This is right now normal conditions. Now what happens if your front brakes fail? All right, you step on the service brake, you get a leak. As it starts to leak, the double check valve is gonna sense the weak side and it's going to slide over to the weak side. Once it gets to the weak side and there's no more air to activate the front, it is white. So you stepped on the service brake, there is no air in the front, but look at the back. You have air in the back and air in the springs because you're moving the bus. So you press on the brake, you lose the front. Where do you have brakes? In the rear. Pretty simple, right? So double check valve, slides, seals, you apply the brake, no brakes in the front, brakes in the rear. We have control braking, the bus is gonna stop and we still continue to have that air inside the rear. We'll continue to lose the air in the front, but we have uh, enough air to be able to pull the bus over to a safe location and stop under control conditions. So what happens uh, if the CHP asks you, uh, what happens if the rear brakes fail? Well, you know, what's going to happen is that the double check valve is going to sense that there is less air in the primary rear, ta rear tanks when you press on the brake. You'll start losing the air. Once you don't have enough air in there, guess what? There is no air in that canister on the green side. So in order for the rear brakes to work, we have to take the air out of the canisters in the orange. So when you apply the brake, you have red air, rear air pushes out of the canisters using the spring brake control valve, identifying that the green has no air and the, and the service brake is being applied. So both the rear brakes and the front brakes are working. This is the modulation of the emergency stopping system. This is what's required by law that your emergency stopping system be modulated by your service brake. And the only way that happens, that is if you have a um, spring brake control valve that's working correctly and allowing the rear springs to activate or expand with your service brake valve by modulating the service brake. That's your emergency stopping system. Here's the problem. You can't check it. All right, uh, their only way to check it is by going through a recommended inspection. So here's the next one. Let's just say that both of the brakes fail, primary and secondary system fail. The middle linebacker doesn't know what to do. That double check valve is going to go this way, that way. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You're probably going to hear the sound of uh, the air exhausting, right? You're going to see the needles drop. So what do you do? Pull the bus over. As long as you have air in the system, the bus is going to continue to stop and break uh, through modulation on the service brake. But you don't have one tank. Both tanks are losing air. So right about where 60 PSI is, at around 60 PSI, that spring is going to begin to expand because there's not enough air pressure to keep it together, right? So around 60 PSI, it starts to expand and somewhere between 60 and zero, the bus is gonna stop, all right? And when I say the bus is gonna stop, uh, it's gonna stop probably nice and easy. It's not gonna lock up the brakes unless it's raining, then that's a whole different ball game. Uh, we're not gonna get into that. Uh, but but um, again, the bus stops by itself. So in uh, when it comes down to it, you have no air in the front, no air in the rear, no air in the parking brake side, the bus is going to stop automatically. You don't have to do anything. All right. So this system is redundant. If you lose the front, you have brakes in the rear. If you have, if you lose the rear, you're going to have brakes in the front and in the rear using the parking brake emergency stopping system through the service brake. You lose both brakes, the bus is going to stop by itself. By itself. So it is a modulated system through the service brake. 
and automatic actuated by you doing absolutely nothing. Just lack of air is going to stop your bus. But here's the question. Do you know how to check your air brake system so that you're checking all of the systems, not just the front brake system, the rear brake system, service brake system, the lower warning device? Can you check or have you checked the emergency stopping system? There's only one way to check the emergency stopping system, and that is to be able to drain the tanks separately. The problem is, just like in the Martinez accident, it's not required. If you have the capabilities of draining the front tank first, you can check the lower warning device, come on to lower than 60 all the way to zero, right? Once you get to zero, you would be able to move the bus apply the service brake and only have rear brakes in the bus stops. That tells you that one side of that emergency stomping system is working. Now you let the air build up to the maximum again, and then you do the same to the rear. You drain the air, lower warning device comes on no lower than 60 and stays on at all pressures below 60. Once it gets to zero, you push in the parking brake, move the vehicle forward, apply the service brake, and now you're gonna hear the emergency stopping system. Every time you step on the brake, you're gonna hear that that emergency stopping system is exhausting air from the rear and it's now giving you brakes in the front and the rear. If you drain them both, then the bus will basically uh, lock up or the, the springs will expand and then the bus is not gonna be able to move once it gets to about 60 and at any pressure below 60. So that's pretty much it. When it comes down to it, your air brake system is pretty redundant. Now, what we're gonna do is, I had a video, but uh, well, I was supposed to create a video, but I was unable to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take you outside and I'm gonna do a recommended brake inspection. This inspection is not required, all right? But it is the only way that you can do a brake inspection and check your emergency stopping system. I'll say this, if you are, um, if you're a pilot and you have a landing gear and the law doesn't require that you check the landing gear, would you check it before you take off? So think about that as I uh, walk over to the bus. Okay, can you can you see me? All right, I think we got it. You should be able to see me now. Uh... All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get on this bus. I can get in here. All right, so we will be uh, sitting down Turning on the bus. Let me close the door because we have a child check and it's gonna go crazy. All right. 
Uh, as you can see, this bus actually has a, um, a manufacturer air gauges over on the left-hand side. Uh, the intervals for each of those uh, gauges is uh, about 30 PSI a piece. So what we did is we added a separate set of gauges to give me 10 pound increments. So that would be easy for me to teach someone uh, what one pound or two pounds look like. Uh, good luck teaching someone what two pounds look like in that. All right, unless you have a, a digital type uh, gauge, then it's going to be pretty hard. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check the air governor. Uh, this is, again, the recommended inspection. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to step on the service brake. All right. When we step on the service brake, we're going to be looking at our gauges and watching to see if the air governor cuts in. So first, let me make sure that we're not building any air at this point in time. So I'm gonna accelerate just a little bit. Okay, so they're not moving. At this point in time, I'm going to apply pressure to the service brake and uh, wait several seconds. Light pressure, wait a couple of seconds. I usually count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. 1,004, 1,005, 1,006. Doesn't look like it moved. I'm going to apply pressure one more time. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Uh, still not moving, not rising. I'm gonna apply pressure again, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1005. It's now moving. The air governor cut in at about 109 PSI. I'm going to do an air governor cut out. And all I'm doing now is I'm waiting for those needles to stop rising. And I'm going to hear some exhaustion of air. All right. So I heard the exhaustion. I don't know if you heard it, but I did. Uh, my uh, air governor cut out at about 122 PSI on one gauge and 121 on the other. Um, what we're going to do now is we are going to go ahead and shut the engine off. And as I shut the engine off, I'm making sure I'm at air governor cut out setting. And what I'm going to do is called a static test. Static means nothing, don't do anything. You sit here, don't apply the brake, don't do anything, just look at your gauges. Static test is basically checking to ensure that you are not losing any air in your tanks and anything connected to the tanks all the way up to the service brake pedal without including the pedal. So um, there's all kinds of stuff that's connected to the tank that can leak. So we're just checking to make sure we're not losing any more than two PSI. As I wait for the two, for the uh, actual one minute, I should lose no more than two PSI. If I lose more than two PSI, I'm going to uh, stop the inspection, write it up and get it fixed. So we'll wait the one minute. So we'll, um, for the purpose of time, we'll wait the one minute and uh, we didn't lose any pounds. The next step is going to be the applied air loss test. The applied air loss test requires that I apply pressure to the service brake, that I disengage the parking brake, which is backwards, disengage the parking brake, putting air in that spring brake canister in the back, and also in all the brake pods, front and back, all right? I'm going to wait for one minute, and I should lose no more than three PSI. So, I'm going to apply pressure to the service brake, full pressure, punch in, push in the parking brake. If you look at the uh, gauges, you're going to wait for one minute. You should lose no more than three PSI, and you're checking for leaks in the whole system. At this point in time, you pushed in the parking brake, so that parking brake could be leaking. Uh, you pushed in the service brake. 
that service brake could be leaking. But now you put air in the brake canisters, the lines, the hoses, the fittings, the relay valve, the spring brake control valve, blah, 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 blah. And at that point in time, your CHP officer is going to be like, wow, this person knows way too much. So you wait for one minute, you lose no more than uh, three PSI. I lost absolutely nothing. Uh, we're assuming that a minute has passed. Pull the parking brake for safety. At this point in time, this is where things change. This is the only way you can check that your double check valve is working, uh, that your spring brake control valve is working, and that uh, your emergency stopping system has the ability to modulate through the service brake. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and turn the key in the on position. Okay. It's on. I actually have a drain that allows me to drain manually. And when I drain the front tank, as you can see, it's moving, right? When I drain the front tank, I'm waiting for the lower warning device to come on and it should come on no lower than 60 PSI, all right? Uh, that warning device is going to be here. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna drain the air. If you look at this gauge here, it is not moving, all right? My double check valve works. That is the only way that I can check that double check valve, all right? It's working on the front side, so it is sliding over to the front. Now I'm waiting for the lower warning device to come on. I'm going to go really slow so I know I, now do you hear that? Lower warning device came on, low pressure, PSI, I'll note it, the front tank lower warning device came on at 70 PSI and must stay on at all pressures below 60. I'm going to take it all the way down to zero. All right, at this point in time, because I'm the only one in the bus, I would start the bus, push in the parking brake, move the vehicle forward, apply the service brake, and the bus should stop. I promise that it does work, but that's exactly what you do. So now I'm gonna build the pressure up, all right? I'm gonna go ahead and help it out for uh, time purpose here. Notice that my lower warning device stayed on at all pressures below 60. My double check valve worked because it still has full pressure. And the bus should have stopped with rear brakes only. The front were gone. Build up to the maximum. We're going to repeat the process this time. All right, so it stopped. This time, what we're going to do is we're going to shut the engine off and the key in the on position. Now we're going to do the same process, but for the rear tank. So I'm looking to make sure that the rear drains, the front stays put. Double check valve is working, it's sliding over to the rear, and I have front good tank. Take it over to zero. Okay. 
Now, here's the good one. At this point in time, when it gets to zero, I'm going to start the bus up. I'm going to push the parking brake in, place it in starting gear, move the vehicle forward. And what's supposed to happen is I'm supposed to hear exhaustion of air when I apply the service brake. And I'm also going to hear exhaustion of air when I release it. So it sounds differently. That's what you're doing. You're looking for the emergency stopping system to tell you it's working. So you hear it, it's applying the rear uh, parking brake system by expanding the spring when you apply the service brake. So here we go. This one, I'm not gonna move the bus, but I'm going to start it, disengage the parking brake, and maybe you can hear it. We'll find out. Push in the parking brake, forward, let go of the brake. Don't know if you heard it, but when I applied the brake, you heard an exhaustion of air. Try this at home. It is the only way that you can check the emergency stopping system. So that is your recommended inspection. Of course, the last two inspections would be your parking brake. You, you would build your pressure back up to, uh, to air governor cut out setting. So at least 100 PSI, you would move the vehicle forward. You would apply the parking brake and that would be your parking brake test. The bus should stop. And then prior to putting this bus in operation, full pressure, move the vehicle forward, apply the service brake, and the bus should come to a stop and not move to the left or to the right. And that is pretty much your brake inspection. So if you can give me about 30 seconds to get back into the office, I will, I got to turn off the child check. I will answer some questions and that's all she wrote. I'm probably making you guys sick. This is a better view. All right, I'm gonna turn the phone off. Well, I see a question <clears throat> and the question is on the Martinez accident, did we throw a compressor? Great question. Um, what they did find is, oh, hold on, I'm coming into the office. All right, I'm back. this bigger here so that I can see you guys. All right, so um, <clears throat> so you're correct. So, so what happened was, is they found that uh, the compressor was seized um, and the, um, the, 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 the belt itself had actually come off of the pulley. <clears throat> so, so yeah, so that could have been the cause of why that compressor was not working um, and not building air anymore. So it, that, that's correct. That was the failure of uh, the compressor or either that or the pulley itself coming off of that, uh, that compressor pulley that, that caused that. So let me check. Uh, I hope that answers the question, but you are correct. Uh, what we do know from the accident is that um, the, uh, the pulley was not on, on um, or the, the, the belt itself was not on the pulley. All right. Any other question? Oh, can I get a certificate of attendance for this for in-service hours? Uh, Barbara, what you need to do is send me an email and I can do that. Um, let me uh, put my email address.
All right, so that is my email address. If you send me your full name, uh, name, last name, uh, then I can send you a certificate of completion or attendance and, um, and we'll do that. Uh, will this be available um, in a PowerPoint presentation format so that we can share with our drivers? Uh, I don't think I can give you the PowerPoint, but what I can do is I've posted this um, or this video is going to be posted on the YouTube page and you can use the YouTube page uh, with with the presentation. Um, I might uh, I might be able to help you out. Shoot me a shoot me an email and let's talk. Um, any other question? All right. Do we have any other questions? Anything? All right, appearing none. Uh, you know, this is all I have at this point in time. Thank you so much for, um, oh, last one. Um, it's not required, but can we do that for the test every day? Yeah. Absolutely. So, Bonnie, you can. Uh, you, uh, if your bus has the capability of splitting the tanks, uh, that is what you should be doing. It's not required uh, for our school district until we have that capability on all buses. We won't require it from the driver, but we do teach the driver, just like we did today, to uh, split the tanks to know if the emergency stopping system is going to work. So, yes, you can. You may. And if you have any questions, you can come see me because I know where you work. And uh, I can walk you through the steps uh, on this, you know, any specific bus. Any other question? All right, Peering none. Thank you so much for attending the class. I really appreciate everything that you do. Uh, pupil transportation safety only happens because of people like yourselves putting the time and the effort to uh, learn, professionally develop, and ensure that uh, you're great at what you do. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Take care and have an absolutely wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.